Well, my name is Sarah Whittle, and I have the privilege of being the assistant principal and registrar at Woodsworth College. On behalf of the entire Woodsworth community, I'd like to welcome you and let you know that we are delighted that you have made the decision to join us. Please know that all of us at the college are here to support you as a student at the University of Toronto. I'd also like to welcome you to our first webinar for incoming students. I hope the information that we'll be sharing with you today will be helpful as you begin your transition to university studies. You will be receiving lots of information right now. As a new student, there is a lot to learn about courses, about services, about resources available to you. Before all of the really detailed course-related presentations that we'll be hosting throughout the next month, we wanted to give you an opportunity to learn about the various transition activities and hear from some upper year students about the advice they wish they had received, as well as provide some strategies for maintaining a healthy school life balance. So during the next 90 minutes or so, we'll be covering a quick overview of the summer transition mentorship and orientation programming that is available to you. Then we'll hear from six student panelists who will be addressing questions about university studies and student life. And then we'll hear a presentation from the college's community development and wellness coordinator. And you'll see that the Q&A function, which appears at the bottom of your screen is active. Please feel free to ask any questions that you have through the Q&A. Uh, and we have a number of advising staff and upper year students who are working behind the scenes to answer your questions. Oops. So the first important resource that I wanted to highlight is the Welcome to Woodsworth course site. All new students will have received an invitation to join this virtual hub that will walk you through your next steps. This resource contains all the information that you will need as a new Woodsworth student. If you have not received the invitation to join the site, please check your junk folder. And if it's not there, please reach out to the registrar's office so we can be sure that your invitation is resent to you. So this course uses the Quercus platform. And the Quercus platform is the University of Toronto's online teaching and learning environment. All your courses at U of T will use this learning tool. So familiarizing yourself with how it works will be very helpful in preparing for your courses this fall. And the site has many learning modules that will walk you through key information that you will need to be familiar with as you begin your degree studies. And those modules include an overview of degree requirements, information about planning your first year and choosing your courses, the many tools that you will be using to plan and register for courses, and those tools would include the academic calendar, course timetable, ACORN, which is the student information system, and Degree Explorer. There is also a module on fees, financial aid, and scholarships. In addition, there are resources for academic success and residence and student life information. So basically everything that you need to know as a new student is on the course site. So you'll want to take a look and familiarize yourself with the content in the modules. So starting next month, we will be running information sessions as you'll see on this chart. And I've taken this information from the Welcome to Woodsworth site. These sessions last for about an hour and are led by an advisor from the registrar's office. In the first half, the advisor will highlight some of the most important information from the site. And in the second half, there's an opportunity to post questions and have them answered. You can actually choose to attend any of these sessions, but we'll use examples from the particular uh, fields of study on the dates as indicated on this chart. The sessions are run as Zoom webinars, exactly like today's session. And registration for the sessions can be done through the links on the Welcome to Woodsworth site. As you're going through the Welcome to Woodsworth site, if you have any questions that are not answered there, we highly recommend that you attend one of these sessions so that you can get those questions answered. So the next program I wanted to highlight is Arrive Ready for U of T. And this is a free online academic preparation program provided through the Faculty of Arts and Science. There are several modules to choose from, including one designed specifically for your admission stream. Through Arrive Ready, you can get an inside view 
of what to expect in your upcoming university classes. There will be learning activities that will include university level lectures and academic preparation materials and tools to help you develop your study skills in your subject area. You'll develop skills in note-taking techniques, critical reading and test preparation, and time management. Students will be placed in weekly study groups where you'll meet future friends and classmates. The Arrive Ready programs run from late July to late August and have a time commitment of about five to 10 hours per week. So we highly recommend that you take a look at the programming available through Arrive Ready. You should have received an email about Arrive Ready that includes registration information. And there's also the link here listed on the slide. The most recent email that has gone out about this program was sent June 20th um, in an email about first year opportunities. The deadline to register for Arrive Ready is Monday, July 4th. Next, I wanted to highlight a program called Moving Forward, which is offered through the university's Accessibility Services Office. Moving Forward is a summer transition program specifically for new incoming students living with disabilities. It is a one day program which helps you navigate academic accommodations at the university level. It gives you strategy for man managing life inside and outside of the classroom and teaches you university level academic learning strategies and skills. Please note, if you're not able to attend the session that list is listed on the slide on July 6th, there are other sessions running throughout the summer, and you'll find those details on the website, which you can see on the slide. Any student who wishes uh, to have academic accommodations starting in the fall term needs to complete a student intake package for the Accessibility Services Office by Monday, July 18th. And details about the intake package can be found on the Accessibility Services website. So as I mentioned earlier in the presentation, the staff at Woodsworth are here to support you through your academic journey. There's a whole team of staff who are available to support you as you navigate the university and connect you to any supports that you may need. There are academic advisors who you'll be meeting at the sessions in July, learning strategists, student light staff, and health and wellness staff. Another resource is the college's awards officer, Yvonne Hilder. Yvonne is just going to speak briefly about the ways in which she can assist students with financial matters. And I'll pass over to you, Yvonne. Good morning, everybody. It's so great to hear to see you all today. Um, we have over 240 students and student families joining us and looking for information. And that's really the first step, looking for information. And the second step, if you need clarification on anything, please ask for help. I'm here to assist you with any financial aid and financial matters uh, that you may have questions about. And just to get a little bit into uh, more detail about some of the things that are on the screen in front of you, uh, the simple answer is to what do I do is anything financial related. More in depth, you might reach out to me if you have questions about how to defer your fees. If you're a student getting a sponsorship, including band funding, you might connect with me if you have questions about OSAP or your student loan, a tuition fee deferral related to that. Uh, you might reach out if your student loan doesn't provide you with enough funds and you need to apply for a grant. Or if something has changed with your financial plan and you have an unfortunate situation such as an emergency, please reach out. And finally, if you're one of those lucky students who's getting a scholarship or if you're getting great grades and you think you should be getting a scholarship, I'm happy to meet with you. I really look forward to working with you. Back to you, Sarah. Thank you, Yvonne. So now I'm going to introduce Natalie Morning, who is the Student Life Programs Coordinator at Woodsworth. And Natalie is going to share some details about orientation and mentorship activities. Over to you, I'm just gonna stop sharing. Over to you, Natalie. Thank you so much. Uh, it's a pleasure to join you today. Um, I just want to go through 
Uh, our Woodsworth College Office of the Dean staff. Um, my name is Natalie Morning and I'm the Student Life and Equity Coordinator here at Woodsworth. I'm looking to connect you to student life outside of academics to support uh, your journey here. Um, we have our Dean of Students, Lisa Nassim, uh, our Student Life Officer, uh, Channeling Access and Tradition Transitions, Kim Cuozo, our Indigenous Advisor and Community Outreach Specialist, Charlotte Big Canoe, and our Community Development and Wellness Coordinator, Jamie Seo, who you will be hearing from a little bit later on in our presentation. Uh, so for today, I just wanted to go over a couple of summer items for you to get you started in your Woodsworth journey. So our first point of connection can be the summer e-mentorship program. And you would have received some emails here around uh, summer e-mentorship. So if you were unsure of connecting, uh, there's still opportunity for you to connect with this summer mentorship program. And what the mentorship program does is it connects you with an upper level peer, as well as some of our staff at the office of the Dean. Um, in advance of your arrival on campus and in advance of your first classes, uh, to work on some of those uh, academic and uh, campus connective pieces uh, so that you come into your Woodsworth journey with a community. Um, I will also say that there are many draws and giveaways still to come over the summer. So again, if you hadn't, if you have not had a chance yet to connect with us, uh, you are more than welcome to join the program. And this mentorship program will continue into the 2022-2023 academic year, um, and will allow you to have that kind of community-based support um, and peer-based support here at Woodsworth as you go through your inaugural year. Another thing I'd love to put on your radar is our Woodsworth One uh, pairing of courses. So Woodsworth One um, is a smaller community focused course run via Woodsworth that allows you to take a humanities course, order and disorder in a small class classroom setting here at Woodsworth. And so what it allows you to do is have a little bit more of a direct connection with professors as you start your academic journeys. Um, it includes co-curricular pieces, um, which enhance your learning through um, experiential pieces like field trips. You'll have access to guest speakers, and there will also be workshops specifically designed to build your academic skill sets. Um, this includes test taking and time management, so a great way to kind of prepare before your midterms. Um, you also have connection to a whole suite of upper year mentors and support staff, um, as well as myself as the coordinator for Woodsworth One um, to assist you in your academic journey. And so to register in Woodsworth One, you can do so via ACORN, which is where you will be adding uh, academic courses uh, into your schedules. And there is WDW 151, which is our fall term course. Uh, and there's also WDW 152, which is our winter term course. Um, you can join us for the winter, uh, the fall term. We encourage you to enroll in both the fall and winter terms for the full experience. And please note all of the field trips and guest speakers um, and uh, various activities will be uh, in a hybrid model with many pieces happening here on campus at Woodsworth. Um, and it will be a whole new suite of exciting events in the winter session. So we look forward to seeing your registrations there. Lastly, something exciting, I wanted to mention orientation. And so our orientation week will kick off Sunday evening, Sunday, September 4th, and we'll go through until Sunday, September 10th. Uh, orientation is a full week of programming and it's specifically designed to assist to get you to know campus better, to connect with your peers, to connect with upper year, upper year students, leaders, our office, um, all through really fun and engaging events. Um, there are also academic components and things of that nature. Uh, so there'll be lots of information for orientation coming your way over the next few weeks. And the best place to keep up with orientation announcements is via Quirkus, which Sarah has mentioned um, will host uh, your courses. This will also host your orientation updates. 
Um, and we will link you registration details for tickets. Um, there will also be a link coming towards a student discord um, so that you can get connected a little bit in advance of arriving on campus. And this year's theme will be space. So you'll get a chance to connect with our orientation coordinators and orientation team who's working very hard to bring you an excellent orientation experience there. Uh, that's it for incoming summer programs. Um, but on behalf of the Office of the Dean of Students, we look so forward to connecting with you this year and welcome to Woodsworth. Uh, I'll stop sharing now and I'll send it back to Sarah. Thank you so much. Thank you, Natalie. I'm now gonna share my screen once more. All right, so next I'm very excited about our student panelists. Um, so we have uh, six students who are here to share lots of great tips that they have accrued over their years of study at U of T. And I'm going to call on them to introduce themselves briefly. Um, and if I can start with Jessica J, and then we'll just work through the, the list as we can see on the uh, slide here. So I'm going to pass to Jessica. Hi everybody, uh, my name is Jessica. I am a fourth year student, uh, double majoring in political science and philosophy. I use she, her pronouns, by the way. Um, and yeah, uh, I guess I'll say something cool about me is I'm the Wixa president this year. So it's nice to connect with you guys this way as well. So really hope you enjoyed the presentation. I'll pass it off to Cheryl. Thank you, Jessica. Um, hi everyone, my name is Cheryl. I use she, her pronouns. I am all both in life science and humanities. So my programs are a double major in molecular genetics and microbiology and human biology with an arts history writer to spice things up. Um, and I'm also entering my fourth year. I can pass it on to the next person. Hi everyone, my name is Chubby and I'm a second year student in computer science. Um, and I really hope the student panel helps you guys. Uh, passing it to Zeno. Hi everyone, I'm Zainab. I'm entering my fourth year. I'm majoring in criminology and double minoring in history and French. Um, I'm also on Wixa as your equity commissioner. Hi everyone, my name is also Jessica. Um, I'm going into my fourth year. I'm doing a statistics specialist and a biochemistry major. And fun fact, I'm from Vancouver, so West Coast represent. <laughs> Hi everyone, my name is Lauren and I'm a rising sophomore at Raman Commerce specializing in finance and economics with a minor in psychology. And I'm in the social committee of WEXA and I'm also the incoming speaker series chair at the University of Toronto Business Association. Nice to meet everyone here. Thank you so much to our student panelists for introducing yourselves. So we do have a series of questions that we've gathered, gathered over the past couple of years uh, of questions that students who are in their first year have asked. And so we thought we would pose these questions to our student panelists so that you can hear from them um, and get some great advice. So our first question is, what do you think is the most important difference between doing well in high school and doing well at university? And I'm gonna ask Jessica J and then Cheryl and then Zainab and then Jessica X to give us their thoughts. All right, yeah. So. The last time I was in high school was probably like three, almost four years ago, but I'll try to remember. Um, yeah, I'd say one of the biggest differences of doing well in high school and university is that in high school, or at least from my experience, your high school teachers would constantly pester you and send like you reminders about everything, about assignments, about things going on in the school. So they'd be like, have you finished your assignment? Do you understand this topic? You know, they're always on you to make sure you're understanding. And in university, that's a little different because Obviously, all our professors have hundreds of other students to manage. They have other classes that they're also dealing with. So they just don't have the time to kind of like, you know, do a personal check in. And that's where it kind of falls on you to take that initiative to go and see them. So you need to kind of stay on top of what you don't know, what you know, questions you want to ask them. And, you know, they're the best person in the field, obviously, to answer your questions about the coursework. So, you know, I, I would say just taking the initiative to know 
you know, to keep on top of what you do know and don't know, and that's how you're going to kind of do well compared to from high school to university. Yeah, that's a great point, Jessica. Yeah, besides like the independence aspect, I would also add like in terms of doing well, your goals are very different in high school versus university. In high school, you're really covering all the fundamentals to prepare you for higher education if you wish to pursue higher education, which all of us are. Um, but in university, you really have the opportunity to really dive into what you're really passionate about so you can actively engage in research, explore programs that are tailored to your personal passions and experiences. So what you do well in is dependent upon what you want to do well in, um, right? So in university, if you wish to go to professional school, graduate school, there is a lot more professional development in university. So doing well um, goes into that regard as well. Yeah, that's exactly on my point. So in university, you know, it's a little bit different because here you have an opportunity to do something, uh, to do well in something that you choose and that you enjoy, as opposed to doing an array of subjects. And this is really an, an amazing opportunity for everybody to just explore what they really like. And then that's where the responsibility falls a little bit more on you because, you know, here you are, you want to do something that you enjoy, take that joy and that interest, and that will be your way to doing really well in university because there is that flexibility there is that opportunity for you to really like exceed and do well and I think that's a really big difference than in high school where you are more limited to certain subjects and limited to certain uh, resources and even just like the time the amount of time that you want to take to finish your degree is very different than um, and even the pressure to finish early is not the same with high school. So that's something that's also very, very different to keep in mind. Yeah, I think honestly, in my experience, I'm also just like echoing back what the others have said. In university, you are basically, you are in charge of your learning experience and that you have lots of freedom to kind of customize and um, how you want to shape your learning experience. But that also means that you have a lot of responsibility in keeping yourself accountable and staying on top of deadlines. And so you also have to be proactive in reaching out to your professors, unlike in high school, where maybe your teachers will be the ones reaching out to you. And professors, as Jessica said, they have so many students, so many classes, they won't have the time to reach out to you. And so one thing is to really be proactive in your courses, talk to your professors, because they are experts in their field. Thank you. So next question, U of T is so large. How do you meet friends and get to know each other? Uh, and I'm going to ask Lauren, then Shavi, then Zainab to answer that. Yeah, so um, U of T is such a large community with people coming from, you know, different parts of the world. And U of T is such a community that is culturally diverse and open-minded. And there are like plenty of ways for you to get involved and meet some great friends here at U of T. So if you happen to live at the Woodsworth College residence during first year, I guarantee that um, some of your sweet mates will be your best friend um, during your entire life. Um, and also, you can join different clubs or sports teams to be involved in the campus community. Um, so, for example, you can search for different extracurricular opportunities provided by U of T in general and uh, Heart House, which is the student activity center at U of T on a website called CLNX and opportunities provided specifically to Rotman Commerce students on the Rotman portal. And also, if you are in Rotman Commerce, um, there will be um, more group work than you thought. Um, so I think you can meet some of your great friends by doing group works with different people because for different projects, you're assigned to different small teams. So in that way, you can also get to know other students. And I also strongly recommend you guys to join the newly enrolled students group chat to meet some great friends there. And lastly, I want to say that um, don't stress about not knowing anyone when you, when you first come to campus, because everyone here is so open-minded and willing to make friends when they first arrive on campus. And I even met some great friends when I was doing laundry in residence and lining up in front of the food trucks. So yeah, don't, don't stress about um, not knowing any, anyone when you first come here. So everyone is super nice and friendly. Yeah, so um, clubs and extracurriculars such as like sports or the varsity games are great ways to like make friends. 
But I think that also just talking to the person you're sitting next to in class is a great way to make friends. Um, such as like one of my closest friends actually was someone I just randomly started speaking to in one of my classes. And I think that's also like a great opportunity to capitalize on to make friends. Yeah, so just to kind of like bounce off the last couple points made because they were really great. Um, clubs and associations, um, in the beginning of the year, they're a great place to start. They always have welcome sessions and like uh, welcome events, which are a really great opportunity. I uh, definitely recommend going to those. Um, go to as many as possible, even if you don't think like you have an interest in whatever the club is um, like meant for, even if like you have a small interest or you think, okay, maybe this would be a good opportunity to like meet different kinds of people, just do it. Just make a little bit of time and go because honestly, it's really great. If you can, 100% recommend it. Um, I also recommend in your tutorials, um, they will be much smaller uh, group sizes than your lectures. So it's also a really great place to, you know, start like building uh, certain skills, like trying to speak to the person next to you or having group discussions or like it was said, a group projects. So there are a lot of opportunities. I know there's also a lot of like discords and different ways you can engage on social media to meet people. Um, just don't don't feel like there's no one there that like you, can, you can't talk to. Everybody's in the same boat, especially in first year. Everybody's like new, especially coming on campus. It can be quite intimidating, but really just look for those small spaces. UFT has so many of them and it's just really great. Make a little bit of time if you can. And there's online for sure. And there's in-person events. If you can make it to an in-person event, I think that's really the optimal thing for you to do. Great, thanks for that advice. What strategies do you suggest in choosing first year courses to keep your options open? And I am going to ask Jessica J, then Cheryl, and then Jessica X to answer. Awesome. Yeah. So um, this is, I guess, one of the biggest things that I was worried about when I got into university, because there are so many social sciences and humanities courses that you can take. And I was like, oh, my gosh, which one do I want to do? Right. So um, one thing that I did was I went through the academic calendar. There's a page for different programs and just go through that page and just kind of see which programs interest you. So for me, it was like philosophy, political science and criminology. And then just go through each of the requirements for you know um, doing that major or that specialist and find courses that like overlap. So for example, for criminology, you had to take either a political you have to take a full credit in political science and a full credit in philosophy. And I said, okay, that works out for me because I want to do political science. And to do a political science major, as you can guess, you had to take a full credit in political science. So you know. I kind of, at the end of the um, year, when I had to decide which major I wanted to do, I was like, you know what, I really like political science, so let me just continue with political science. But it did leave the door open to do criminology if I did choose to do that. So um, I'm sure the registrar's office will send more information about the academic calendar and the pro different programs that you can do. So um, definitely look for overlapping courses and then just kind of plan accordingly like that. Yeah, I can speak a little bit more on like my life science courses, but I'm a spreadsheet gal. I love me some Excel or a Google Sheet. So I do have a spreadsheet where I pretty much do the same thing as Jessica, where I listed all of the programs I was interested in um, prior to my first year. And then I also kind of worked backwards. So I looked at what fourth year courses I really wanted to get involved in or what I kind of wanted to pursue in my upper year courses and see what prereq or required courses you had to take in order to be eligible for those courses. And what you'll often see in life science courses is a lot of the prerequisites do align. Um, you will take pretty much the same prerequisite courses as everyone else in life sciences, um, which is great because you do have that option to switch between programs. If you end up realizing that a certain program may not be for you later on, even after you've picked your programs at the end of your first year. Um, and that's just something I really appreciate about the Faculty of Arts and Science. But again, if you do want to keep your options open, um, I recommend to look at what courses interest you the most in your upper years and work your way backwards there, and then see which ones, like Jessica mentioned, align the most. Um, and again, it just works out with life science courses because they all align. And there's also great resources for you. Um, if you're worried about your degree requirements, there's something called Degree Explorer, which I highly recommend to look at. And I refer to that every time I do course enrollment. And then I just try to make sure that I'm covering all the different combination of courses I can take um, in order to make sure that I have all the program requirements I have covered. 
Yeah, so I think for me, my experience is also very similar to both Jessica and Cheryl's. Um, I know when I was going into first year, I was very stressed in picking my courses because I was worried that I would, I didn't want to shoehole myself into one direction. Um, but what I also did, like Jessica, was go through the academic calendar and find the programs I was interested in. And like Cheryl said, in life science, what you'll notice is that a lot of the programs have the same first year uh, required courses. And so after first year, once you take those courses, you have so many different options in the life science programs to choose from. Um, and also looking at upper year courses that you're interested in, seeing what the prerequisite courses for those are. Again, you'll find that there is a lot of overlap for the first year courses. And so that really helps. It also is important to keep in mind that, like Cheryl said, like after your first year, once you pick your program, you can always change your program again. And so that was something um, I actually did after my second year, I switched into my biochemistry program from a different life science program. All right, now an important question. What do you know now that you wish you had known in first year? And I will ask Lauren, then Xavi, then Zainab to answer that. Yeah, so um, if you are a newcomer to Toronto, I would suggest you to take some time to explore the city um, and also try out new restaurants, going to different art exhibitions, etc. Just so you can keep a balanced lifestyle um, aside from your um, academic responsibilities. So, you know, uh, mental health is also very important. And also, um, if you live in the residence, I recommend you study at the um, Wordsworth Residence Common Space. So um, you will have a very great view um, in the room when you are studying. Um, and I didn't know like uh, the comments, there are so many common spaces inside the residence until the second half um, of my uh, first year. Um, like I, I always went to the Roberts Library, which is a huge library um, just beside Woodsworth resi Residence. So if you are looking for a place to study, I recommend you check out the common space inside the residence. And also you can use all facilities at Hart House, which includes the swimming pool, as well as um, piano um, and, and attend um, group exercise classes there for free. So I strongly recommend you guys to check out these resources as well. I think one thing that's great to remember is that the professors are very accessible. Like you can reach out to them um, about various topics and it just doesn't have to be about your coursework. Though, of course, like reaching out for your coursework is always a plus for you. Um, but like you can just like get to know your professor more by attending their office hours and asking them questions about like themselves. Again, even if it's not related to what you're learning like, classes like I had a friend who would always attend his office uh, like one of the professor's office hours to just ask about like the awards this professor had won um, in their academic career and what else they can like do with their education and other courses they would recommend because the professors do have like very great insights that could help you plan what you want to do and also it could inspire you to um, follow another path that you may not have considered throughout your academic career. Um, in first year, I had assumed that I was already enrolled in my major because I had applied into my major. Um, and then I, I learned that that was not the case. So that is just something to be aware of throughout the year. And when you're, you know, taking your courses is that you will have to apply at the end of first year to um, be in a major. And there are different requirements for that that are different than the ones that you were applying to uh, in high school. So it's something to keep in mind that that is a little bit of a difference when you enroll in, um, into arts and sciences. I, I can't speak for sciences. I know definitely for arts, it's, it, it's that way. So um, I had initially enrolled into ethics, society, and law, and I am currently doing criminology because, you know, your grades and the courses that you choose, those are all different when you come from high school to university. So, and the expectations, um, you'll, you'll see them a little bit more clearly when you look at the program requirements. Um, it's nothing to worry about, but it's just something to keep in mind because 
Um, I at first was worried about it because I didn't understand much that like, you know, it's, it is something that's different, but again, there's like tons of resources you can, uh, access for that. And it is there, there will be a lot of notice for when you actually have to apply into post. So it's nothing to worry about. It's just something to keep in mind when you're picking your courses. All right. Our next question do you suggest that I get involved with extracurricular activities right away in my first year or wait until I'm in my program? And I will call on Warren, then Cheryl, and then Jessica X. Yeah, um, so I personally speaking, I suggest you to get involved with extracurricular activities right away when you first arrive on campus um, because most of the clubs at U of T hire first year interns when the first when the fall semester starts, which is typically during the um, September and October. Um, and also the first year intern position will provide you the opportunity to get insider insights of the structure as well as um, operations of the club that you want to be part of. And it also provides you an, uh, an advantage when the club is hiring board of directors or executives for the next school year. Um, so I applied as a first year intern at the University of Toronto Business Association last year when I first arrived on campus. And I was selected um, to be one of the interns and I had the opportunity to lead the intern team and plan for an event during the start of the winter semester. So then by the end of first year, I was promoted to the position of speaker series chair and I was in, and I will be in charge of leading the directors and executives to plan different um, events during the next school year. So I strongly recommend you guys to apply for these first year opportunities that will be provided to you when you arrive on campus. And also another way to um, get involved is through joining the standing committees at Hard House, which is the um, Student Activity Center here at U of T. So, um, you know, there are different committees ranging from finance, debate, and we also have a farm committee. So if you want to um, get involved, you can apply to join these committees during the start of fall semester as a first year representative. So yeah, I strongly recommend you guys to um, get involved in these extracurriculars, even if you don't, you are not 100% sure in terms of what you want to study or what your future career paths will be. So by joining these clubs and taking advantage of these opportunities, you will be able to, you know, find your passion. Yeah. Yeah, so um, I, also, I actually kind of did the opposite. I took a step back and I didn't really get involved right away. Um, so there's a lot of extracurriculars and opportunities on campus and at U of T. And I actually say, no same student has the same social or academic experience. And one of the advices I got by a professor is to be intentional about what you get involved in to whatever makes sense to you. Um, so personally, I tried to be reflective of my goals and I want to go into medical school. So my goal was to transition well academically and make sure I have the best GPA I can start with. Um, so I decided not to get involved with as many extracurriculars in my first year. I actually didn't get involved in any extracurriculars um, just so I can make sure I was pretty set academically. And then I started to seek um, and reflect what specific opportunities I wanted to get involved in. And I got more involved in my second year. And that didn't really hinder me because now I'm president of two clubs. So I would say like whatever makes sense to you, um, that should you, you know yourself best and whatever timeline makes sense to your goals, professionally speaking, um, and whatever makes sense to you in your timeline as well as an undergrad, there is no wrong choice. Um, and yeah, I highly recommend again, to reflect on your goals, your priorities, and then seek from there. Um, but yeah, for me, I didn't really start until my second year. And, but I, I knew exactly wanted, what I wanted to get involved in just because I had more experiences on what I was more interested in during my first year um, that really helped me narrow down um, all the extracurriculars I wanted to get involved in later on. Yeah, I think also speaking from my experience in first year, it can be quite overwhelming. U of T has so many different clubs and extracurriculars. And if you're still, if you're also unsure about your program, it can be really overwhelming to decide which extracurriculars you want to do. Um, something that I did in first year is many different clubs, you can join them as a general member where you can attend a few events, your time commitment is not that is not that great. If you want to attend some events, you can. If you're busy or you're not feeling it, you don't have to. And so that's a way to kind of dip your toe in the waters to maybe try out a lot of different extracurriculars and also get the chance, the benefits of meeting new people at these events. And so 
after maybe after your first year when you're a little more settled into what you want to learn or kind of what types of extracurriculars you want to take you can then maybe start taking on bigger executive positions in these clubs what is the number one mistake that students make in their first year and i will ask Sainab, jessica j and cheryl to give us their thoughts so for me i think the biggest uh mistake or loss of an opportunity is not speaking to your professors i think that's a really great place to start i know we've talked about it already a little bit but truly they are a fantastic resource a fantastic person to have in your network um really in university that's what you're trying to expand and where you want to really create uh, a really big network for yourself and professors are a really great way to do that they are there to answer your questions they're there to help you um with anything that you like with questions that you have uh re regarding the course or not they're there for resource um sorry references i think that's a really big thing especially for people looking to go into um programs again like graduate school uh, references are really, really important. And by establishing a relationship with your professor early on, um, you make yourself memorable as well as um, are able to just have someone there for you in case you need it, whether or not you actually end up utilizing that resource, that reference or the resource, it, it doesn't really matter. But the important thing is to start early because it really will be beneficial for you. I can speak for myself um, in first year. I didn't really connect with any of my professors, but I learned quickly that that was a distinct advantage for myself. So by second year, I was already establishing uh, connections with professors that were relevant to my uh, studies, as well as those who I knew could give me um, a really good reference and whose class I was doing well in, importantly. Yeah, so uh, I also agree with Zainab with speaking with professors, but personally me, I'm kind of really shy to like when, when speaking with professors. So I think that one of the mistakes I made was not talking to upper year students who are in my program or in like, you know, the field. So like, um, as Natalie was saying, we have like an e-mentorship program where you are connected with somebody, an upper year student, whether in your program, and you can ask them questions. So I thought that I had to do everything alone. And I like, if I could go back in time, one thing I would do is like ask upper year students, what courses do you think are good for like this major? What courses do you think would interest in you? So, cause they have done it before, you know, and they've done it recently. So I think I would just ask upper year students, their experiences, um, what their thoughts on, you can send them your, um, sorry, your schedule, say, what do you think about this? And they'll tell you, no, don't do a morning class. You're not going to wake up in time, you know, like, like that stuff. So I would say just talk with your upper year students. They're not that scary. They're really nice. Yeah, I just wanted to add like resource, seeking out resources is really important. Um, and I'm speaking on experience on this next part, but making sure you prioritize good habits. <laughs> Um, healthy, good, healthy habits. So making sure you're eating properly, making sure you have a good sleeping schedule. It's so, so important. I did not prioritize that, which did affect how I performed in my some of my exams. So I highly recommend to, besides, you know, making sure you transition well academically, you have good supports um, and everything like that in university, but you're also making sure you're taking care of yourself, especially in first year, because a lot of the things you learn and you start doing in first year will carry on later on. So trying to make sure you get those habits down. If you're living in Woodsmith College residence, um, cooking is something that we all do because we don't have a dining hall, but it's a great way to really be a great adult and learn how to cook, um, as well as taking care of yourself and doing your chores and you know making sure your, your places are clean. Um, so yeah, that is something that I highly recommend you prioritize um, and sleep, sleep, sleep is very, very important. <laughs> All right, so on that same theme of taking care of yourself, what do you do to handle the stress of those crunch times at school? And I will pass back again to Cheryl and then Xavi and Jessica Jane. 
yeah, it's not actually the same answer to this question for me, but having a good sleeping schedule is your top priority. But sometimes it just doesn't work out and that's okay. Um, so I recommend to make naps your best friend. And I do recommend to keep them between 50 to 20 minutes. Scientifically speaking, um, if you go longer than 20 minutes, it will be past a certain um, sleep cycle, which can make you groggy and tired afterwards. I didn't want to get into too much of the neuroscience and psychology of that, but uh, making sure you do utilize naps if you can. Um, but something I like to do during those crunch times, whenever you're kind of in the middle of studying and you're like, oh, I just really want to stop or I really feel tired, but you have to keep going. What I do is I really just imagine myself completing the exam or completing that paper um, and also making sure I plan something fun with friends or just something for myself at the end of it to just keep me going. And I imagine how um, that once I'm done with that, it's going to feel so great and so well, and you kind of just have to get through it in order to get to it. Um, but something I also like to do is make sure I incorporate breaks throughout my um, study schedule, as well as workouts. Like I enjoy a good workout and at our athletic center, as well as our athletic facilities, we have lots of classes, drop-in classes, including bar, which is like Pilates mix, um, yoga, which is jogging yoga, cardio fitness dance parties, as well as something called Big Hit, which is high intensity interval training, if that is your thing. Um, so those are great ways for me to kind of make sure I'm getting active um, while also making sure um, I'm studying and taking care of myself, so. What I would say um, really helps is prioritizing. So if you're like work, um, involved in a bunch of clubs and extracurriculars, it's important that like, for the week of the exams or like the week before, like you almost completely stop with those. So you have enough time to prepare for all of your exams. And it's also important to start early. So again, like there's usually like a lot of material to cover um, to just go over and revise and make sure you remember everything and you know everything uh, come exam day. So starting early, um, prioritizing that, you know, this is important, you can get back to most of your other commitments later on, but for now, your exams come first and it's um, the academics is also why we're at university. So it's very important to prioritize that first. Awesome, yeah. So one thing I like to do during exam season is at the very beginning, just go through each of your syllabi, like syllabi, sorry, and see when your like when your assignments are due and write it down on your calendar. And then an awesome resource that I like to use is the assignment planner. I couldn't find the one for you um, for UTSG, so I'm going to drop the one for UTSC, but it's also a really good one. This is the one I use. I just dropped it in the chat if everyone can see it. You can put in the assignment that you're doing when you start it and when you have to finish it and it'll like plan it out for you it'll be like finish an outline by this day finish this by this day because as much as I hate it you can't do an assignment the day before it's due like you need to space it out especially during these times and like Cheryl said like physically write down break 10 to 10 15 like write it down and hold yourself accountable to take that break because you're gonna burn out if you just say no I can keep working I can keep working just write down those breaks and yeah, that would be my advice. So the next question I'm going to ask all of our student panelists to answer, and that is what is one resource that you find yourself utilizing again and again throughout your undergraduate studies? And maybe we can do the order that we introduced um, our panelists in, which I think was Jessica J, then Cheryl, Xavi, Zainab, Jessica X, and then Lauren. So over to you, Jessica. All right, hello again. Um, I would say the best resource that I have ever used is the old exam repository. All the old exams are on there. Um, it might be a little dated, but nonetheless, it's like the same content maybe, and you can kind of see how they're going to word questions, what questions they, like, well, sorry, what topics they'll ask, what they won't ask. And, you know, your professors might not tell you this, they might not tell you that this resource exists, but it exists. Oh, yes, thank you, Barbara. Thank you so much. Um, yeah, so definitely look at those old exams. Um, try using them as practice tests, and it gives you like a really good gauge where you are in the course. Yeah, that old exam repository I live by as well. There's also midterm um, 
practice tests that the Arts and Science Student Union also offers. There are no donated exams that you can check out. But one thing that I also wanted to add is the UTSU Health and Dental Plan. So this is an additional insurance that is added on um, and it's provided and covered in your tuition. It's provided by UTSU, which is a University of Toronto Student Union. Now this plan covers health, vision, dental, as well as traveling. And it also covers things like chiropractic service. My posture has been terrible <laughs> during online schooling and chiropractic, um, chiropractor and I think physio as well. There's also massage therapy that is all covered within the plan and you do pay for it with your tuition. If you don't wanna pay for it, you can opt out, um, but that is from the utsu.ca website. So wait, I think like first year should definitely like utilize especially if you're staying residents like it's not really a resource but do go to the common rooms and study there because it was my favorite place to study in my first year um it's i don't know like the, the place is just like really good for studying um so do use that and i think like it's just very convenient especially if you're staying residents Uh, for myself, I, I'm i always on the U of T library website, um, whether it's to check out books. I've, I'm someone who enjoys taking out physical copies of things, so I always use that. But I also really like the website for citations. I know when it's like crunch time and everybody's like just trying to like line up all their citations of their work. Um, it's a great place to just get that done because, you know, it's going to be done correctly. Um, that's just like a small thing that I like to use and I only started using like last year um because I you know was just like browsing through the website and I found it um definitely use it it's great uh just make sure that you're like double checking everything because sometimes it's like not aligned with the actual book that you're using so it's just like a general citation so just like be careful of that but otherwise it's a great place instead of using like third party uh websites like citation machines sometimes that's just really handy for you Yeah, I think just adding on, I live by the old exam repository during exam season. Um, but another resource that I've has been like my best friend through undergrad is the writing center. Um, I personally feel that my writing isn't that strong. And so I've gone to there with like assignments and essays and they give really great and detailed feedback. And it has been a savior in many of my courses for me. Yeah, and adding on to the writing centers, um, if you are in Rotman Commerce, there will also be a um, professional presentation coaching that you can book a session with um, the professionals to like go over your presentation and provide you some advice. Um, I would definitely recommend to check out that. And also before exams, I recommend going to office hours and extra review sessions provided by professors or teaching assistants before exams. Um, and also, um, if you ever have any questions with um, program enrollment or course selections, you can always book um, time with academic advisor to have your question answered. Um, and also, um, Additional, additionally, I recommend to check out the uh, uh, Center for Clubs and Leadership Development at, at U of T if you want to further develop your leadership skills. Um, and personally, I joined the Leadership Exchange Program during last year, and I found the um, webinars and um, you know sessions provided by, this, by that center really helpful for me during group projects, etc. So yeah. Great, thanks for those really helpful suggestions. I think we have time for one more question. And the question I'm gonna ask is, I've heard that U of T is harder than other universities. Is this true? And I'm going to ask Cheryl and Jessica Jacob to give us their insight. Yeah, so I work as a campus tour guide and I get this question a lot. Um, so I can't speak about other universities. My experience has only been at U of T, but U of T can be challenging and difficult. Um, um, just to give you context, we are part of the arts and science um, faculty, and when you do are part of the arts and science faculty, you're pursuing an honors bachelor, which means all of your classes are honors level, um, which is good because it does challenge you academically, but again, it does challenge you academically. Um, so you're also being taught by the top professors, leaders in their field, so sometimes the course material can get overwhelming, but they do challenge you in great ways. Um, you do, it is a big adjustment and it, it can be tough. Um, the workload can seem a little heavy at first when you're starting out as well. 
But again, um, we do have lots of support services that we've mentioned today that will help you get there and um, help you transition well. And a statistic that I do know from the recruitment office um, at the St. George campus is that 91% of our first year students do succeed and advance into their second year. Um, so even though you might hear around that U of T is hard, don't worry, we all succeed. All of us here in our panels, we're all up for years, we've made it through, and we are here to help you in any way. And all of the mentorship um, programs are, as well are there for you to learn uh, about ways in order to succeed as a U of T student. Yeah, pretty much Cheryl said what I was going to say, like, you know, it, I don't know what to say about other universities because I've only gone to U of T, but um, like this presentation was a great resource, you know, you learned about all the different resources that we have. And like one thing I think a professor told me was, you know, you got accepted here. That means you can do it. Right. So you're here for a reason. Just have faith in yourself because the only person that's going to believe in you is you. So just do it. You got it. I believe in you guys too. Thank you so much um, to all of our amazing student panelists. We really appreciate all of the amazing tips and ideas that you have for our incoming students. Um, if you still have questions, uh, please feel free to keep popping those into the Q&A. Uh, but we are now going to move to a presentation by our Community Development and Wellness Coordinator at Woodsworth, and that is Jamie So. Um, she's going to share some thoughts about maintaining a healthy life balance. So I am going to pass over to Jamie. Thank you so much, um, Sarah. I hope everyone can hear me. I'm going to be doing a presentation just about how to balance your mental health and academic success and sharing a bit of strategies and tips on how to build more of a healthier balanced lifestyle as you transition to university life. So a little bit about me. Uh, my name is Yanju Jamie Sa. I use she/her pronouns. Um, and actually, I'm a Woodsworth College alumni. So I did my undergraduate degree here, um, and I just recently finished my master's of social work at the university. I've also worked at U of T for about seven years as both a student staff and a, a full-time professional. And most of my work centers around student wellness, student leadership within the context of both student and residence life and also looking at equity, diversity, inclusion, and access. I was also a commuter student for most of my undergrad and also new to Toronto. And so I know how hard it can be, especially for those that are new to the city or maybe don't have as many social connections to prioritize wellness, especially if you're on the train commuting for two to four hours a day. And also um, a bit about my cultural background, I'm from Korea. And so that ties into a lot of my own personal struggles around talking about mental health due to a lot of, a lot of stigma and shame and also lack of awareness of what mental health was. Why I'm sharing all of this with all of you is my role, as Sarah mentioned, is the Community Development and Student Wellness Coordinator. And part of my role is to, one, provide one-on-one -on -one supports, counseling, and referrals about mental health and wellness to students, providing education and training such as this about topics related to wellness and mental health, and also running various programs and events dedicated to mental health awareness, as well as um, community development. And I wanna share parts of myself with you because I hope that you can put a name and a face to a story. And maybe there are parts of what I shared today that, that you may relate to. And why that's important is throughout the years as I've worked with students, it can be very difficult and scary to reach out to someone that you don't know. And so I'm hoping that as I get to, as you get to know me at least um, a little bit today and throughout the year, um, you might feel more comfortable reaching out to me if you ever need support or resources. So it's first important to talk and differentiate between mental illness and mental health. So the Canadian Mental Health Association describes mental illness as disturbances and thoughts, feelings and perceptions that are severe enough to affect day-to-day -day functioning. So some of that might be anxiety disorders, schizophrenia or mood disorders, such as major depressive disorder or bipolar disorder. And what's important is mental illnesses, you have to meet specific um, criteria. So you'll have to show different criteria, symptoms and signs and receive a psychiatric diagnosis. 
Mental health, however, is more of a state of well-being and everyone has it. So just as we all have our physical health, we all have our own mental health to care for. And it's about thriving. How do we find ways to succeed and, you know, find ways to have more positive and stronger mental health? So, um, for example, it says here, one in five people in Canada will experience a mental health problem or illness in any given year, but five of five of us have mental health. And so that's really important. And the reason I want to bring this to you today is I think it's important to start having these open conversations about mental health and mental illness in order to reduce the stigma for both. And mental health is about how do we maintain a healthy, happy state of well-being and recognizing that mental health will fluctuate constantly. So just because you have different tips and strategies doesn't mean that you'll always have positive mental health. In fact, throughout the year, as many of your student colleagues have mentioned, um, it's going to be stressful at different points of the year, whether it's academics, life events, work, et cetera. But if we have these tips and strategies to um, help us with our wellness, it can make us uh, more resilient and make it easier for us to bounce back. So these are just some examples. It's not an exclusive or exhaustive list, but good mental health might look like a sense of purpose, knowing kind of, you know, the direction you want to take your life in, um, some of life's meanings, having strong relationships and social supports. This is a really, really important one. And I'm going to touch on this one more throughout the presentation feeling connected to others, um, having a good sense of self and self-awareness, being reflective of yourself and your goals, being able to cope with stress efficiently and effectively, and also finding ways to enjoy some of the, the smaller and bigger things of life. Why is it important for us then to have a workshop like this at a time like this? Mental health education is really important, especially in a post-secondary setting. And I'll share with you some statistics that maybe you know or maybe you don't know. 75% of mental health problems actually appear before the age of 25. So for many people coming into first year, you will be under the age of 25 and this will be a critical transition period for you. So why we do this in education and why we talk about it is when we recognize signs earlier, it can be a lot easier for folks to get treatment that they need a lot early on. The number of students also on college and university campuses with identified mental health challenges has actually doubled over the past five years. And there's schools have seen an increase in number of students that are coping with anxiety, depression, drug use, and suicide. And that's actually increased significantly since COVID. And it's also important to recognize that participants from various visible minority groups and underrepresented groups have poor poor health and mental health outcomes, especially with the pandemic. And why this is relevant, again, early education and intervention is important so we can recognize signs and symptoms early. But it's also important because what we need to remember, and I think there's often a myth that if you have mental illness, for example, um, it, there's a lot of negative stigma and shame associated with it. But actually, for most um, if not all, if you can catch and recognize signs early and receive the appropriate treatment for mental illness, you can live a normal daily function just fine. Um, but the issue is when we let these symptoms manifest and don't recognize that we need support, it can be a lot harder for individuals to access the care that they need. Um, and here, you know, mental health is important because you're going to be experiencing a lot of um, maybe common uh, experiences. So anxiety and depression are a big one. Um, a lot of studies have found that students report, I guess, um, lower levels of anxiety and depression, but they do tend to increase as the year goes on, especially with busy exam assignment periods. Academic stress is a big one. You're going to be obviously under a lot of pressure, especially during December or April, a lot of those final exam times. Imposter syndrome is a big one. So what that means is it's sometimes a collection of feelings of inadequacy that persist despite evident success. So even for me, for example, um, coming into different roles or even working at the university or even in some classes, I feel like everyone knows you know, what they're talking about or what they're doing and I don't. And I feel like I'm an imposter. And it's very easy for us to question ourselves or 
our knowledge and expertise, and that can lead to you know experiencing lower mental health. Life stress is a big one. Uh, I think it's really important for us to talk about. We're not just students. We're children. We're friends. We're family members. We're workers. We're this. We're that. And life events, especially also societal life events, will impact us significantly. And so it is important to recognize that academics aren't the only thing impacting our mental health as students. Social anxiety and isolation is a big one. Um, I think, especially with the pandemic, it's gotten a lot harder for individuals to find that social connection. And it is important, as I mentioned earlier, having a strong safety network and social connection is very, very important for someone to have more positive mental health. And so we need to find ways of how do we help students, um, especially those that are maybe more introverted or maybe have um, chronic health conditions or individuals that are commuting? How do we help individuals that have less access to events, programs, etc., to make sure that they st still feel connected to the university? Um, another one, feeling overwhelmed and being unable to prioritize your physical, mental, and emotional health needs. And that's something I'm going to be talking about a little later about how do we balance our priorities and maintain a more balanced lifestyle. And then this last one is probably the most important one. And again, I'll touch about it a bit later. U of T, and I'm sure um, all the panelists here can agree, U of T has a lot of resources and supports. But the problem that I've noticed is it doesn't matter that there's a lot of supports when students don't feel comfortable accessing them. And if students have multiple concerns, they don't know which resource to go to. And so I'm hoping we can have a little bit of a conversation about um, providing some more information about resources and also showing you, you know, it's not that scary to reach out once you know the system. So this I think is really important because as I mentioned, it's important to have these conversations to break down some of the barriers of accessing support and talking about mental health. And destigmatization is really important. Even for me coming from a culture that doesn't talk openly about this as maybe North America um, does, how do we talk about it in a way that's safe, that's positive, and that's welcoming and understanding? So it's not that scary. And I'm hoping today it will give you some, you know, something to think about and reflect on on how do I care for my mental health? Have I thought about mental health? Is that something that's important to me? And if not, um, how do I make it so that it is a priority for me? Another big one is keeping an eye out for signs. And this is both for yourself and for others around you. As I mentioned, a lot of mental health concerns come before the age of 25. And so how do we recognize signs and symptoms in ourselves? And how do we recognize signs in our peers or those that we care about? And how do we create a culture and community of care so that we're caring for each other and creating these safety networks? And how to be kind to ourselves and others. I'm gonna be showing you this two minute video about, um, it's by Br Brene Brown and it's on empathy and, um, So what is empathy and why is it very different than sympathy? Empathy fuels connection. Sympathy drives disconnection. Empathy, it's very interesting. Teresa Wiseman is a nursing scholar who studied professions, very diverse professions where empathy is relevant and came up with four qualities of empathy. Perspective taking, the ability to take the perspective of another person or, or recognize their perspective as their truth. Staying out of judgment. Sorry. Perspective taking, the ability to take the perspective of another person or, or recognize their perspective as their truth. Staying out of judgment, not easy when you enjoy it as much as most of us do. <laughs> Recognizing emotion in other people and then communicating that. Empathy is feeling with people. And to me, I always think of empathy as this kind of sacred space when someone's kind of in a deep hole and they shout out from the bottom and they say, I'm stuck, it's dark, I'm overwhelmed. And then we look and we say, hey, and climb down. I know what it's like down here. And you're not alone. Sympathy is, ooh, <laughs> it's bad, uh-huh. <laughs> uh, no, you want a sandwich? Um... <laughs>
Empathy is a choice, and it's a vulnerable choice, because in order to connect with you, I have to connect with something in myself that knows that feeling. Rarely, if ever, does an empathic response begin with at least. I had a, yeah. And we do it all the time. Because you know what? Someone just shared something with us that's incredibly painful, and we're trying to silver lining it. I don't think that's a verb, but I'm using it as one. We're trying to put the silver lining around it. So I had a miscarriage. Oh, at least you know you can get pregnant. I think my marriage is falling apart. At least you have a marriage. <laughs> John's getting kicked out of school. At least Sarah is an A student. But one of the things we do sometimes in the face of very difficult conversations is we try to make things better. If I share something with you that's very difficult, I'd rather you say, I don't even know what to say right now. I'm just so glad you told me. Because the truth is, rarely can a response make something better. What makes something better is connection. So why that video is important is, you know, that last point, what makes it important is that connection. And sometimes, you know, the work that I do is a lot of listening work. It's about being empathetic to ourselves and also to those around us. And I think that's something, if there's anything that you can take away from this presentation, I hope it's that, you know, we need to care for ourselves first in order to care for people around us. And the students that I work with, a lot of times they'll come to me and say, you know, I regret not reaching out for help earlier, or I, I regret not knowing about this. And, you know, my work is just to listen and to say, you know what, it's okay. The fact that you're reaching out for help now, that's the most important part. And so please make sure that you're caring for yourself. And I think too, it's important to recognize that while we do ask folks to reach out early because it will be helpful down the line, that doesn't mean that if you reach out later, you're not going to be um, benefiting from the same resources. It's more so that you have all the knowledge and when you're ready and you're comfortable, you are able to take that next step of reaching out because it can be very scary. And that is why I wanted to share a bit about myself with you earlier is to show, you know, I'm just another person. I'm pretty chill. I'm kind of funny at times. And, and you know, I'm not scary. And it's not scary to reach out to someone like me and my peers. And so... I'm hoping that that's something that we can take away from today. Um, and I, I want to kind of leave you with, you know, the last couple of slides, we'll be looking at some tips and strategies. The first thing, and a lot of these actually the student panelists covered, which is excellent. Long hours don't equal productive hours. And it's important for us to be flexible and, and you know, manage our time wisely and manage our tasks. Cramming the night before um, an exam, which I've also done, so I can't really say anything about that, it doesn't always lead to positive academic um, success. And it's actually, in the long run, not going to be helpful for us to develop healthy working and, and school habits. And so it is a lot better for us to think about ways of balancing our schedule accordingly. If our midterm is two weeks away, let's say, maybe we're doing two hours of study a day rather than doing you know, a 16-hour study session in one night. Setting personal boundaries is a big one, not just with our time, as I mentioned, but also with our relationships. For example, if your friends are constantly going out to party or going out, maybe you're setting boundaries like, you know what, every Friday or every Saturday, I'm going to be going out. But my weekdays and week, weekday nights are only going to be dedicated to studying. Or finally, to set boundaries with, with peers as well. That is a really important um, human trait just to have in order to just say no if you're not comfortable and being able to set those accordingly. Discovering personal strategies is a big one. So again, this list is just some guidelines, but it is really important for you to figure out what works for you and what doesn't. Again, managing your time, as Cheryl mentioned, you know, scheduling in um, and penciling in breaks is really, really helpful. Collaborating with others, if you find that working with peers is helpful, you know, seeking out those collaboration or even if, let's say, I always recommend make a friend in every class because if you miss a class, you could ask them for notes and things like that. Don't overcommit. There was a question earlier about should I get involved in academics or extracurriculars earlier or later. My advice would be get involved in what you're interested in, but don't take on too much. 
what's helpful is maybe doing one extracurricular starting in your first semester. If you find that you can balance, you know, your work, life, school, et cetera, balance, then maybe taking on a second one in second semester or in second year. Same with a job. If you're working and you're commuting and you're doing school, try to prioritize what's important for you right now. Try it out. If it works, great. You can add something on. If it doesn't work, then you know, and you're not overcommitting. And discover, you know, again, your own strategies. Making your health a priority is a big one. So eating a healthy, nutritious diet, if you can, which is really hard nowadays, especially with resident school or with food prices going up. But being mindful of nutrition and food is really important. Getting enough sleep. Lack of sleep is associated with increased stress, and it's actually linked to poor work-life balance and academic success. And so trying to get enough sleep when you can, and one way might be to turn off your phone, or there's a lot of apps nowadays that help with productivity and sleep, so relying on those. Prioritize your physical, mental, and emotional health. Try, you know, maybe meditation, or mindfulness, or yoga, or sports, or something and also making time for commitments and hobbies that are important and meaningful to you to relax. And some of this might be relaxation um, and multitasking. So let's say, for example, I really love music. So I'll listen to music or listen to a podcast as I'm commuting, or I'll do, I'll find ways to get in my wellness during the busy times of my schedule to work around that. Again, developing and regularly connecting with support systems. And it's important to try and develop these early in life. And orientation is a really great opportunity to start doing that at U of T. Having open dialogues and conversations about the importance of maintaining, you know, this healthy work-life school balance. And then this last one is really important, knowing your rights and options. So it was mentioned earlier, knowing a bit about the health dental benefits and plan if you don't opt out. Again, if you choose not to opt out because you don't have your own insurance plan, you can, you know, opt in for the or you can stick with the U of T benefits plan. And as it was mentioned, health benefits, dental benefits, massage therapy. What's actually really important uh, to recognize is therapy. So counseling supports are covered. I believe it's up to $1,500. So what that amounts to is about $100 per session for 15 sessions. And that's something that a lot of people know because they don't know because therapy is very, very expensive. So look into this health dental plan. I think the website was dropped in the chat and look at your options and know what your rights are. And then what I wanna leave you with is some resources. Um, so what's available? The registrar's office, everyone is awesome. They're ready to help and they can help with really anything with academics, myself. Um, health and wellness has an embedded counselor. What that means is health and wellness runs a lot of our um, health, uh, Care. So um, if you're looking to see a psychiatrist or a, a social worker, they have folks available on site that are registered professionals with their respective colleges. And each college system at the university, so Woodsworth, for example, has our embedded counselor. So this is someone that works for health and wellness that only meets uh, Woodsworth students, which is really important because the university has so many students. If you have an embedded counselor that you can go to, it makes the wait times a lot um, shorter. Uh, accessibility services is available, peer support. So relying on a lot of the student mentors, orientation leaders, upper years, and just peers that you're gonna be coming into university with. I wanna flag my SSP and Good to Talk. These are amazing resources. They're free, they're confidential, and what's great is they're 24 seven. Um, my SSP is good because it's available in an app that you can download on your phone as well, and it's available in multiple languages. So if English is not your preferred language, you can speak to a counselor in a language that is preferable to you. And my SSP is good because you can text or call with a counselor. Good to talk is also great because I think you can speak to a counselor for about an hour and you can keep calling back. And it's great if you're going through a mental health issue at like three in the morning and there's no professional staff or a therapist available at that time. Physical fitness, so flagging, you know, Heart House has a lot of amazing events. Sport and Rec run by the Faculty of Kinesiology is really great um, and etc. How do you reach out for support? Emailing folks or phone. Um, so if you go on the websites for different uh, departments or sites, you can find their contact information and 
typically some folks are doing drop-ins, but right now with COVID, most are appointment-based and most likely remote, so virtual, but there are in-person offerings. A lot of our programs, so our Dean of Students um, office is going to be running a ton of programs throughout the year that you can come to and just meet people and get to know some of the staff. Uh, asking student and student staff and staff at Woodsworth for a referral. So again, our Dean of Students office, some of the resident scons, if you're a resident student, Wixa, I think Jessica um, was on and you can speak with Jessica and other Wixa members about, um, you know, different resources available, our registrar's office and et cetera. And what's important here is there's never a right time to ask for support, but if you have a question, just ask. For example, for me, if you have a question about anything, even if it's not wellness related, I can help direct you to the right resource. And same with our registrar's office, for example. If you're requiring academic support and wellness support and you go to someone at the registrar's office, they'll know who to direct you for the wellness support. So that might be me, that might be health and wellness, et cetera. So think about what your needs are, but just know that there's a ton of folks available at the college that are ha happy to support you um, in your journey to university. So thank you very much. Thank you very much, Jamie, for providing that really helpful overview of what to expect when transitioning to university studies and providing all those details about resources that are available to students. Um, as Jamie mentioned, we are all here uh, to help you be successful at U of T. So that concludes the formal part of the presentation. We do still have staff available on the Q&A probably for the next 15 minutes or so. So feel free to stay on and ask any questions that you may not have answered yet. Um, and I did wanna say a big thank you to our student panelists, to the students and advisors helping on the Q&A, uh, to Jamie for her terrific presentation, and a very big thank you to everyone who's attended this webinar. We do hope that you've come away with some helpful information that will assist you as be you begin planning for the coming year. And we really look forward to welcoming you in September. So I'm just gonna pop up a slide which has uh, the contact information for the registrar's office. So if you have questions after today's session, um, please feel free to reach out and we hope to see you at information sessions in July as well. Thanks so much for attending everyone.